Hi, my name is Pamela Coons, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Oncology at Yale School of Medicine and Yale Cancer Center. I'm excited to announce ASCO's new open access journal, JCO Oncology Advances. As the inaugural editor-in-chief, I hope to support JCO Oncology Advances to become the premier platform to bridge the gap between accessible scientific research and clinical care. Stay tuned for more information, including new article types, at ascopubs.org forward slash JCO Oncology Advances. We look forward to seeing your submissions in spring of 2024. This JCO podcast provides observations and commentary on the JCO article, Palliative Sedation and End-of-Life Care and Survival, a systematic review by Marco Moltoni et al., my name is Nathan Cherney, and I am the director of the Cancer Pain and Palliative Medicine Service in the Department of Oncology at the Shari Tzedek Medical Center in Jerusalem, Israel. I am a medical oncologist with a specialty interest in palliative medicine and medical ethics, sedation for the management of refractory suffering. Oncologists have a clinical and ethical responsibility to relieve the suffering of their patients as they approach the end of life. This is especially challenging when caring for patients who develop severe symptoms that are inadequately relieved despite our best clinical efforts, including the use of experts in palliative medicine. In situations of otherwise intractable suffering, the use of controlled sedation to induce a state of diminished awareness has emerged as an important therapeutic option to relieve the burden of otherwise intolerable symptoms. The aim of sedation therapy in this setting is to provide adequate relief of distress in a manner that is ethically acceptable to the patient, family, and healthcare providers, and which is consistent with normative ethical concerns of proportionality and avoidance of harm. Apart from its use for patients undergoing noxious procedures and in weaning from ventilator support, sedation therapy is usually a treatment of last resort because of its anticipated adverse outcomes and potential risks. For the patient, the anticipated adverse outcomes of sedation are impairment or the loss of the ability to interact, depending on the depth of sedation that's applied. The risks include the potential for overdose, aspiration, or hemodynamic compromise. For family members, the, the adverse outcomes may relate to several factors, including the, ability, the impaired ability to interact with a patient, anticipatory grief, confusion or disagreement regarding the indications for the use of sedation, and perceptions that the decision to resort to sedation was precipitous or perhaps inappropriately, inappropriately delayed, or the perception that sedation may hasten death. The issue as to whether sedation of patients to relieve refractory symptoms at the end of life hastens death is significant to the patient, their family, and healthcare providers. The issue is critical to the counseling of patients, their families, um, informed consent, and to the ethical deliberations that are essential in every case. Dr. Marco Moltoni and his colleagues present a systematic review addressing the impact of sedation for the management of refractory symptoms on the survival of dying patients from admission for inpatient care until death. The analysis was derived from the data from 11 small studies, seven retrospective and four with prospective. All except for one were performed on consecutive patients and the outlier, which, was, which had been performed by uh, Dr. Maltoni's own group, was a prospective prognostically matched cohort study. Most of the patients suffered from refractory organic symptoms, such as delirium, dyspnea, and pain. A substantial subgroup suffered from refractory existential or psychological distress. Overwhelmingly, patients were treated with sedation that was titrated to effect, rather than continuous deep sedation. The systematic review found that there was no difference in the survival of patients admitted for end-of-life care to a hospice or acute care setting from the time of admission until the time of death, irrespective of the use of sedation to the management of refractory symptoms or not. 
being a systematic review of cohort studies, it is possible that the outcome was influenced by differences between the populations of patients requiring sedation and those who did not. Indeed, only one of the studies matched the patient cohorts for prognostic variables. Interestingly and importantly, even when matched for adverse prognostic variables, sedation, sedated patients in that single study did not have an accelerated demise. It is important to note that the vast majority of patients were sedated proportionally rather than deeply. Could it be that light sedation has no effect on survival and that sudden deep sedation does, or could it be that the shortened survival amongst a subgroup, such as those receiving sudden deep sedation, the catastrophic symptoms is lost in the statistical analysis of the larger group? These questions are not answered in a systematic review, and they will not be answerable by a randomized controlled study since it is ethically implausible to randomize patients with catastrophic refractory symptoms at the end of life to a no sedation arm. If there were enough patients who refused sedation for the management of catastrophic symptoms at the end of life, a matched cohort study may provide the answer. So, how do we counsel patients and their families regarding this issue? On the basis of these findings, can we tell patients, their families, or other concerned parties that sedation does not for shorten life? The answer is yes and no. We can now say that the administration of carefully administered sedation to patients suffering from refractory distress at the end of life is unlikely to shorten life. However, we should also warn that it is possible that some individual patients may suffer complications such as respiratory depression, aspiration, or hemodynamic compromise as was reported in one of the few studies to report adverse events. For immediately pre-terminal patients with overwhelming distress, the risk will, will usually be considered trivial relative to the goal of relieving otherwise intolerable suffering. In other circumstances, such as patients require, requiring short-term sedation to gain relief from severe symptoms, the risks may have significant or even catastrophic consequences and risk-reducing precautions, including vital sign monitoring and the availability of an antidote to the sedating agent, are generally indicated. When sedation is used, the, the issue as to whether or not to continue hydration is still an open question. No conclusions regarding the impact of the continuation or withdrawal of hydration on survival can be drawn from this review, and this issue is still unresolved. For oncologists and palliative care specialists, sedation is an important and necessary therapy in the care of selected patients with otherwise refractory and severe distress at the end of life. Since sedation has the capacity to harm as well as to help, the manner in which it is applied is important. Inattention to potential risks can lead to harmful practices such as the abusive, injudicious, or unskilled use of sedation. For instance, uh, abuse of palliative sedation would occur if it, if it were to be used in, pa in patients approaching the end of life with the primary goal of hastening the patient's death. Injudicious palliative, palliative sedation occurs when sedation is applied with the intent of relieving symptoms, but in clinical circumstances which, which, which are not appropriate. In this situation, sedation is applied with the intent of relieving distress and is carefully titrated to effect but the indication is inadequate to, to, to justify such a radical intervention. And this underscores the importance of, of patient evaluation by a clinician who is expert in the relief of symptoms before resorting to this therapeutic option. Conversely, injudicious withholding of sedation in the management of refractory distress occurs when clinicians defer the use of sedation excessively while persisting with other therapeutic options which do not provide adequate relief. Substandard clinical practice of palliative sedation occurs when sedation is used for, for an appropriate indication but without appropriate attention to good clinical care. There may be several reasons for this. It occurs when sedation is started without adequate consultation with the patient, family members, or other staff members when there's inadequate monitoring for, of symptom distress or relief, and when the, when, the, when the dose of sedative is escalated rapidly without titration to, to effect or the use of minimal effective doses. Given the potential for harm to the patient, 
the family or to the reputation and ethical standing of the treating clinician or institution. Prudent application of this approach requires due caution and good clinical practice. Sound procedural guidelines such as checklists can reduce the risk of adverse outcomes in medicine. Procedural guidelines for the use of sedation in the management of refractory symptoms at the end of life can help, can help guide clinical practice to ensure that sedation is used appropriately in this setting and to help uh, avoid pitfalls in practice. Based on a review of practice guidelines, the European Association for Palliative Care has described 10 universally relevant procedural issues which together form a useful frame framework for countries, hospitals and organizations wishing to develop procedural guidelines. These guidelines are available at the EAPC website at eapc.org. This concludes this JCO podcast. Thank you very much for listening. For more original research, editorials, and review articles, please visit us online at jco.org. This production is copyrighted to the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Thank you for listening.